morning and welcome to a very special Bridging and Commercial virtual roundtable, uh, this time in partnership with Glen Hall. Uh, thank you very much to our audience for tuning in and thank you to Guy and Nick from Glen Hall for supporting today's live discussion. We are also joined by a fabulous panel of brokers who will shortly be introducing themselves. I'm really looking forward to your contribution to the conversation. Just a reminder that viewers may put their questions forward throughout the session using the option in your audience control panel, and we will try to get to as many of these as we can throughout. So I've mentioned that it's a special roundtable today, and that's because this is the sort of topic that really excites me and is firmly in our wheelhouse as a publisher. We're extremely fond of interrogating the accepted norms in the industry, and the subject of the so-called rate race is a controversial one that we believe needs addressing. But all credits to the team at Glenhawk for proposing this idea. It's a fairly brave, nuanced question that I can't wait to explore with the panel. We're going to be unpacking whether the race to the bottom in terms of interest rates is ultimately in the best interest of the customer. Increased competition is often considered a mark of a maturing market full of opportunity and choice. One such consequence of a competitive heated sector is the gradual lowering of pricing, with some describing this as the products becoming more mainstream in nature. Changes in the availability and variety of funding for lenders has also added to the interest rates dipping to never seen before levels. E1's Q, EY's Q1 2020 bridging market survey revealed that 70% of respondents cited competition as their main or one of their top three business challenges for that year. And over half expected monthly interest rates to further decrease following a drop from 2018 to 2019, crucially despite climbing LTVs. In the 2021 report published in April, 42% saw that rate decrease realized in the 12 months up until March this year. Moreover, half of respondents expected rates to continue decreasing in the next 12 months. This came as somewhat of a surprise to me, given that COVID-19 changed almost every facet of our lives, and that included the appetite and capacity of lenders, leading to what we saw as a re-engineering of priorities in transactions. By most accounts, being able to simply get the deal done topped most brokers' lists. And there was a return of pricing for risk, something that is said to have been waning in our part of the market for a good few years. The debate we have on our hands is what is best for the customer and why? What is the wider impact of bridging rates, for example, that go so low as to rival more mainstream products? How exactly do we price complexity, risk, and expertise accurately? And what happens if we don't? A poll that we ran online in February this year indicated that speed was more important than pricing to brokers. And we're about to publish some commentary that suggests that constrained LTVs over the past year had a relatively small effect on demand. So who exactly are we lowering rates for and why? Does doing this necessarily drive business and demand? And will genuine borrowers whose strategies involve these forms of finance not still hold up if rates were maintained at a sustainable level. So there's a lot here. Um, I really like to get stuck in. Um, so I, I'd like to just go to the panel to uh, please introduce themselves one by one, and we will start with Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Otway, uh, owner, director at LDN Finance, uh, and specialising short-term finance, uh, including bridging, commercial development. Um, over to uh, over to the next one. Over <laughs> <laughs> to you, Guy. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm there laughing, and it's me. Um, hi, I'm I'm Guy. Um, founded Glen Hawk uh, with Nick, who's on the call. Uh, we're a, a institutionally investment bank backed uh, bridging lender. We've been going around for about uh, three years now. Um, and we've um, yeah, we're uh, honoured to be uh, hosting some uh, some exceptional people on the uh, on this uh, webinar now. Um, Matthew? Yeah, my name's Matthew Roan. I'm director of the Bike Let Broker, um, specialists in, in uh, uh, short term finance, bridging finance, buy to let finance. Due to the levels of um, 
short-term lending we were transacting we actually launched our sister brand the bridging broker uh, earlier this year um, i think it's a really interesting uh, agenda I'm really looking forward to it and, and privileged to be asked to be on it by glenn Hawke. um nick hilton managing director of glenn Hawk, uh, as guy mentioned also co-founder uh, my basic day-to-day -day is to look after the whole origin origination side of the business um, company with Jamie Fritchard is my sales director um, and like I said we're going three and a half years looking to launch of products soon bridging is our speciality right now. No Kim, Kim's disappeared. We will, we're working on getting her back on. Well, I could do Kim as well if you want that's no problem. So uh, <laughs> Rob Jack Groove Group, CEO of Brightstar Financial Group. I have two brands, I have uh, serious property finance, which is where I am uh, now. Apologies for anything that happens in the background. And I have uh, Brightstar Financial based down in Billericay, uh, which is our B2B brand. Uh, all involved in secured property debt across a whole plethora of uh, product lines, uh, 10 years old. And uh, uh, once again, thank you for to Glen Hawk and also BNC for putting this on today. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have Kim McGindley from Five um, on on the the panel as well. Just waiting for her to come back. We had a little bit of technical difficulty there. Um, but let's uh, crack on with the setting the scene a little bit. And Rob, I'd like to come to you first, if I may, to talk about how long this so-called rate race has been going on and in your view what the main drivers have been yeah okay thanks so uh, look, i was also surprised as you were with the eui report that said that um rates were dropping because we'd seen uh no compression in in margins for uh two years and uh there was that that big sort of group of of um new challenger banks that once became banks had cheaper funding cheaper retail funding and, and could uh, could uh, price a uh, much lower down the risk curve. And then for the last couple of years, um, it stabilised. And I think kind of we all were of the view that that's gone as low as, as it should go. Um, and the pricing was was really fair. And similarly, you know, if you wanted those sort of mid um, sort of point fours a month, you'd have to be super vanilla, super prime, low loan to value, low risk, straightforward. Um, I think this uh, perhaps is something that could, with um, time, be deemed as a bit of a storm in a teacup. I think um, we've had one lender in particular uh, that has publicised uh, their lowest ever rate, uh, and I'm not certain I'm seeing uh, the rest of the, um, the the challenges following suit. So, so I think you know it's it's worthy of a discussion point, but there is a very dangerous precedent if uh, others follow. That when uh, when short-term lending rates become the same as long-term commercial rates, there's a complete mismatch in risk profile. Um, and and I think you know certainly the the uh, the other thing which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little while is is uh, what sits behind the actual physical cost of debt. You know what are the extra charges? Are some of these deals being written um, where the true cost of the finance will be uh, met when someone goes? Um, into into a bad debt and they go beyond term and what are the what is the small print and that's something as a firm we're always very keen to understand you know what happens if that client goes beyond the terms that they've, they've given thank you rob kim uh thank you good to see you we've got you live now um would you like to share your thoughts on the overview on this rate race and the driving of, of numbers down and then also what do you believe could be sitting behind the reasons for this happening incrementally thank you and i'm so sorry for the technical issues um hi to everyone my name is kim mcginley i'm the managing director of vibe finance um i think rob just hit the nail on the head absolutely when it comes to pricing and that is because mostly clients when they come to us they're completely fixated on the initial rate and when it comes to bridging we all know um, ultimately you can get possibly a higher rate but once the fees and everything are taken into account and that that's where the true cost comes in 
um, that's when really you need to start comparing that. And as a broker, that's what we should be doing. So it's outside of that pricing kind of war that's going on. Um, and also absolutely on the risk profiling. So you tend to find the lower rates are typically from um, your more um, challenger banks, uh, you know, the likes of Shawbrook and Interbay, where they can offer the term exits as well. But you don't typically find that speed is key. So there's so many factors to take into account outside of pricing when it comes to picking the right lenders for the clients, um, because ultimately that will be the defining factor. So, the, I mean, it is one of the biggest things at the moment that we talk about, and it's all about education. So it's about educating the clients on ultimately the best solution for them, if that makes sense. Totally. And Guy, coming over to you, so Glen Hawk has two and a bit years in the making. How did it feel to come into a market where you were ostensibly seeing this kind of pressure on on interest rates? Yeah, it's interesting, and it's a bit of a surprise to see that the rates had um, rates had come down slightly. I think towards the end of last year, and I think certainly Q1, Q2 this year, as I'm sure everyone on this panel has seen, bridging volumes are exceptional and across every other product as well into buy to let. So I think from, from our side, what I'm seeing is there's just so much liquidity out there in the markets at the moment. There's people sat on hundreds of millions, billions of cash, and it's got to be deployed into assets. Assets at the moment are seeing the safest place to be, whether it's uh, directly to the asset in a CRE, long-term commercial real estate deal, or it's through a bridging lender or a buy to let lender or a, a short-term finance house. There's just a lot of money there. And when you get a situation where the supply is more than the demand, you're going to get this fight that we've got going on at the moment. And the amount of times I'll get, we'll get a deal back from someone and I'll go, sorry, Glenn Hawk, you've, you've lost out on that rate. Um, and I'll go back to the, the broker, or I'll know the lender that has offered the terms, I'll ring them up and go, well, that's crazy. How are you doing that so low? And they'll go, oh, well, we've got this American fund who's just given us X amount of money and they want 20 million a month and they'll do it at 0.45. And it, in, it's really interesting, the, the different nuances, which I'm sure we'll come to across all the different types of funding, whether you're institutionally backed, whether you're a family office, whether you're forward flow and your deals are shadow underwritten on the day of completion and drawdown and so on. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm certainly seeing it that it's just an incredible amount of liquidity. Um, from our perspective, we've tweaked pricing slightly. Nick will comment more on this when, when he speaks, I'm sure, but we've dropped slightly down. But the reality is to run Glenhawk costs is nearly 4 million a year. And we, it, there's a very fine line when you've got a book that ours is north of 100 million in short-term lending when you start to tweak the rates down and down it does reach a point where it starts to get a bit tight and you're thinking mm, this is tricky and we like to pride ourselves on service here the, the quality the minimal fees no exit fees and straightforward the deal will get done in-house there's no external credit here it's all in-house like nick myself and, and the rest of the team so there's a lot of factors there surrounding that um but yeah from from my side i'm just seeing so much cash, which is uh, unbelievable. But I do think it'll start to ease off. And I agree with Rob, it, I don't think it will continue. And I think we'll see an easing off once the once the challenger banks have built up their loan books and they've got the support. Um, I think they'll, they'll ease off a little bit. That's, that's my opinion anyway, for what it's worth. Thank you, Guy. I'm really interested in this concept of the, the cost of quality and, and what that can mean. So I'm sure we'll be diving into that a bit later. So leading into the funding question, Chris, would you agree with the sentiment that the guys shared about supply outstripping demand at present and the amount of money that's being pumped into the sector impacting the availability of low rates? I certainly think uh, demand is high and uh, although supply has increased, um, a lot of the lenders out there have got the similar funding lines and when they're all competing, their rates are all going to be very similar and they're all chipping just a little bit to win the deal. But, you know, demand is high, supply is high. Whether it's going to go one way or another, I don't know. Uh, we see where um, uh, the lenders are sort of positioning themselves in the market to try to stand out from the others. And it really comes down to underwriting criteria, service and their systems in the background. Otherwise, you know, they, they could have the same funding line, the same targets to meet every month, but someone's doing double than the other. And what is the difference between those lenders? Is it like Rob said, is it someone who's sort of hidden some fees in the background that, you know, they're hoping that they can get away with to make a, a higher return at a later stage and then they can chip the rate tiny bit? I mean, they have to have some sort of headline grabbing criteria, rate, product or something to try to win the business because everyone else is doing it. 
you know, we're seeing lenders pushing uh, limits on uh, on how much they're doing, uh, uh, the, the LTVs they're doing on the deals. And leverage is now going, you know, north of 75 percent. And we've seen obviously it pushing up to the 80, 85 percent level now. And, you know, the, uh, it, some people will say it's crazy. It's going to be extremely um, uh, limited on over which deals get across the line at that uh, at that level. But, you know, everyone is trying to uh, uh, sort of expand their business. Everyone has targets to hit. And um, and yeah, competition is high amongst those lenders. And I think that's what we're seeing. And um, you know, brokers are spoiled for choice because, you know, I think even though service levels have probably dipped uh, over the last year, um, whether that's due to, um, you know, COVID related uh, sort of uh, work workflow or work, work work levels within solicitors or, or valuers. Um, but I think within the actual lender, their systems, most of them now are, are, are pretty darn slick so to stand out in this market as a lender it's not easy and I think using a, a headline rate as your, your your target won't get you that far for a, for a period of time you have to be able to deliver you know you, you said it right away in, in the report the fact that the key thing that anyone wants to know when they're submitting a deal is will they get that deal across the line will they drive it through and that is the most crucial thing yes you need a rate to be able to get that deal in but you know uh the deal getting done is the most important thing to the client also just if you don't mind adding adding to what chris has said as well i think let's not forget there is still three clear tiers uh in bridget you have your challenger lenders you have your sort of middle tier lenders and you have your boutique lenders there's still a large amount of north of one percent lending going on within the industry if you look back sort of seven to ten years you know we were pricing 1.25 to 1.5 percent a month 2% on the way in, 2% on the way out, admin fees, op fees. I mean, it was very, very fee driven up to sort of 20, 25% APR. Now, obviously it's become a very retail product now. It's a, it's a, it's a day-to-day product um, and it's needed. You know, retail customers are coming to us every day. You know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have got that. It was either all credit clients or it was ultra high net worth and that was it. So I think although the, the pricing is, there is definitely competition, certainly in the middle tier, and maybe the lower tier. There is still a need for that top end. Um, obviously, I'm not going to name other lenders, but we all know the kind of boutique, smaller um, types of lenders that are out there, certainly in and around Mayfair. <clears throat> and they, they do charge a sort of north of 1% still, and they still get the business. So I think there is definitely a balance with all of this. I think we have seen pricing come down, but it, it's only marginal from last year. I think we've seen 10 basis points on average uh, drop off. In the last year which i wouldn't say is critical uh and i would still say there's enough margin in it for, for lenders to make money what, what what's really interesting echoing what the guys have said but there are only really four areas whether it's short-term lending or whether it's term lending that lenders can compete for business so you've obviously got criteria and and sort of where lenders are willing to push the envelope in respect to that you've obviously got ltv you've got service levels which i'm sure we'll touch on shortly um or confidence of getting the deal done in bridging. Um, and then you've, you've got rate. And, and rate has always been the easiest, if you like, and the most visible way of gaining market traction. So when these new lenders come to market, that market leading rate, because everyone says their service is good. So how do you gain traction? Okay, no one says, oh, our service is average. So, so it's clearly the most visible way to ob- ob- obtain funds. Um, and and as, as Nick said, you know, you go back to when we first started writing bridging finance, way before sort of the buy let broker was born, you know, sort of 15, 20 years ago, one and a half to two percent for open bridging was standard with, with fees in, often fees out, you know, and, and there's 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 no doubt that the the influx of, of lenders that come to market gives consumer more choice, it drives margin down. There are pros and cons, clearly. Um, a race to the bottom in terms of the rate is inherently bad for a lender's margin. There's no doubt about that. Um, but but in isolation, there's more to it and we'll cover that. Cost of funds coming down is inherently good for the consumer and that can drive more money into the lending sphere, can encourage high net worth to diversify more of their investment into the lending sphere. Um, but look, there's a secondary impact as well, which is quite interesting because the more and more compressed the market becomes and the more and more there's not much between deals. You know, Chris talked about sort of it gets so close that you're wondering do certain lenders have hidden fees in the background almost. As the pricing gets closer and closer, then the confidence in the lender and the ability of the lender to get it done and that lender's reputation becomes more key. In other words, 
clients will take a bit more risk if the, if the dif difference in, in cost of funds is, is much higher. So that results in brokers where it's it's a strong client, a start, strong lending proposition, trying to to move towards a select panel of smaller lenders for those for those strong deals where they know the the, the important get the deal done is more important. And then that leads to sort of saying, well, look, we want to place a deal with you. It's it's a, a case that's got considerable merit. Will you price match? And a lot of lenders, including Glenhawk, will be willing to price match. But in many ways, although they're willing to do that for the right deal, it's one of the great reasons why we like using Glenhawk because there's that sort of uh, contrast between having good rates and good service. Ultimately, that also accelerates this race to the bottom in terms of the rate because almost they then begin undercutting themselves and offering bespoke rates that aren't actually there on offer. So there's lots of different myriads of, of, of factors to it. I do think it's good for the consumer in general. In some ways, it's good for the lender because it drives innovation because it comes to a point where, where margin can't go any lower. So, so, so you have to start looking at service and innovation. Um, but, but Kim said earlier, you know, every case on its merits, brokers can't be transactional anymore. Quite rightly, um, lending in the short term space isn't done on relationships now on their own. It's done on, on sort of what's right for the client and, and, and uh, you know, competition inherently can never be a bad thing. Um, although we may see some of these lenders fall out the market as margins get lower and lower and lower. Well, and, and if you don't mind me interrupting for a moment, that there lies the, um, the long term problem. I agree, Matthew, um, short term, this might be good for the consumer, but long term it might be. Because if lenders drop out of the market because there's not enough money to be made, and, and mm -hmm. Guy was very uh, honest with the point he made, and, and uh, others, if, if asked the same question and were also honest, would say the same thing. I mean, you know, we can't just have a bridging market that involves people at the top table with the low margin, low loan to value, low risk. We need a fully functioning bridging market that encompasses everything for everybody. And the danger is that if margins get too tight across the piece, we will perhaps see some market contraction. And all that's going to happen is choice will be reduced. And ultimately, the person that is going to be most affected is going to be the consumer. So I think you're right. Short term, yeah, tick, tick, brilliant. Long term is not a good thing. Yeah. Do, do you just think, Mark, up. Go, on, go on, Guy. I was just picking up on your point, Matt, on um, on innovation there as well. Um, I think it, 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 the competition is good. I like competition, and I think probably speak for most people on it. It's, it's healthy. It causes a competitive market. It causes it forces you to innovate your business and create change. If it was easy, you could just bob along and relax a bit. But you're having to constantly chase your tail. We've got we're up against great firms like MT, Octopus, Lendinvest, Albatross, all those sort of guys in the market and you, you have to try and find the edge, which is quite exciting. So every day, Nick and I have conversations about how you can how you can improve and ultimately that's going to benefit the client, whether it is service and yeah, as, as Chris or Matt said, every, every lender bangs on about how good they are at service. And yeah, we mess up now and then for sure. And we'll put our hands up and say sorry. And it's it's hard with the volumes you've, you've got going on now. Um, but I think ultimately the client benefits out of this and we've got to look at, it, at the balance really. You need a commercially successful business and the client needs to win as well and the whole cycle needs to win but as rob said if we start to see lenders move out the marketplace will we see those rates increase broad brush and then move back towards that one percent days when really i think the pricing is where we are in the market now for for, good, for the good deals is probably about right um well i think it is anyway for now for I, sure. I agree with both that and rob's points I, I would add that that i think there's a saturation in the market right now i mean it's supposedly there's 130 bridging lenders in the market if you include banks that have um, subsidiaries um, as well as the specialist bridging lenders is there a need for that much choice i'm not sure i think a natural fall off in any market is is is, is required i think i think it has to be representative of the client needs so you know clearly there is going to be that that uh, rate race for your vanilla deal low loan to value low risk experienced client you know, which every bridging lender is going to be competing for that business. <clears throat> but but as lending has got more and more co complex over the last five or six years, um, you know, in both spheres of lending, in term lending and in, in, in short term lending, there's a huge space and there's some hugely successful lenders that don't compete on on rate at all. And, it, and they still attract huge levels of business. Yeah. And that was from a combination 
of service but equally criteria and you know we talked someone spoke earlier about sort of what's priced into that you know there's certain lenders that price a certain element of risk into that and that that's going to come into the rate and that's going to fit a portion of the market and we shouldn't lose those lenders and those lenders are required but but i think i think there's space for both and if anything we might see more polarization in the market and certain lenders edging towards the low price and a certain led lenders edging towards the more niche criteria the higher ltvs but i think there's space for both I don't, I don't think it has to be an either or i, I think it's linked to your type of clientele uh, but ultimately this is all linked to the cost of funds as well isn't it and that's where you position yourself in the market dependent on both of those things who do i attract as a broker who do i attract as a direct client and how much money am i making as a lender i think what we've seen over the last year is a phenomenal amount of new lenders coming to the market and i think it's because these people from an outside in look at it these lenders and think well this is quite easy you know you can make good margins you can I've already got the client base, but actually there's there's a lot of hard work behind that and there's a lot of operational costs on top of that. So it's not as straightforward and they will find that out. I mean, someone like Rob, who's been in this industry for so long, is, is going to understand the, the difficulties of growing a business to the size of Brightstar and, and uh, Sirius, you know. So, and like all of us, we're all at the sort of uh, management part of our companies and we, we see the, the ups and the downs. And I think that's something that's key to remember. But I do also think that there will be lenders that will drop off some of the lenders that come to the market because ultimately, although there's a lot of funding out there, sustainability comes from pricing, comes from service, and it comes from relationships. And I think people come into this market as a lender and think, oh, you know, we can do this straight away. But actually, most of these businesses are built on 10, 15 years worth of relationships. You know, how many new relationships you have? I mean, the amount of time that I'll meet a new broker and it's like, what have I got to do to win your to win the business away from someone they've worked with for 10 years? And quite frankly, the answer to that is you probably won't be number one priority because I've worked with these guys for 10 years. And you know, only the other day the guys at Glen Hall met the guys at Bright Star. And you know, of course, Rob and the team have their relationships in place. You know, weirdly, I I pretty much we pretty much launched Glen Hall when uh, Chris launched LDN. So I we had a relationship with Chris pretty much from day one. And actually, one of the girls that started with us on day one, Annabelle, actually used to work with Chris years ago. So that was my intro to Chris. So, of course, you know, we got a bit lucky there. Bear in mind, we've seen Chris's company grow and we've seen our company grow. And likewise with Matthew, um, you know, we, we've caught up a lot over the last year and we're starting to do quite a lot of business together as well. Bright's on the same. Kim, we haven't really got there yet, but this is a good chance to kick off that, I would say. But, um, but all in all, I think there's a lot of healthy competition. But I do agree with Rob, we do have to watch where this goes and we do have to watch uh, how much these rates are driven down because in the end, it will alienate a lot of lenders out there, purely down to the cost of funds and margins. Um, yeah. I just want to jump, just quickly jump in there quickly with um, moving us on just slightly to the priorities when placing deals at this moment in time we've touched on it a bit but one of the facets that's come to the fore in 2020 is also around flexibility willingness to extend and be quite pragmatic about um loans that are perhaps not going as well as they as they should be given given the environment so that's sort of moved up in the list i would say um for for brokers and specifically on the panel uh, kim can you tell us a bit about how your pri what your priorities look like um deliverability i think we've identified is key but what goes into that broad term yeah i mean like we touched upon earlier and like everyone's mentioned i mean every case is absolutely different um when it comes to bridging loans like we've said it is an oversaturated market um, and it really does come down to, you know, more than I think, and COVID has brought this out in the pandemics, more than just, okay, if things go well, but what if things don't go quite well for the clients? And I think there have been some lenders that have been absolutely spot on with their communication, with how they've dealt with um, extensions and things like that. And equally, there have been lenders that really haven't. So as a broker now, we are literally looking, not, when we were looking at the exits, that's fine, but also what happens, like Rob said, if you know you do need, if things do go wrong and you do need an extension, um, 
a lot of this is actually educating clients like we've touched upon because they come to us thinking that they know what they need but after establishing actually do you want a guarantee that this loan is going to go through do you need speed is it just about pricing because there's so many other conversations that lead on from that um also i guess with these new lenders that are coming to market like nick said they all shout about do offering a good service everyone has good service they never say that they have bad um, as a broker, you can kind of try them once, but once you get burnt, um, it's a it's a big lesson because these you can't risk these relationships with clients, especially on bridging when it is higher cost funding. Um, there's just it's it's so much bigger than just pricing, and um, unfortunately, I think that there, that some of these conversations aren't being had. Um, they're just chasing that lower rate and offering those terms as in brokers without fully really understanding what those terms mean. Yeah. Exactly. Chris. I, oh, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> no, it's right, I just wanted to ask Chris what proportion of clients are coming your way solely with the rates in mind and perhaps some unrealistic expectations, perhaps given marketed headline rates uh, to, to Kim's point. How many how often do you need to bring them back to reality? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't do marketing based on rate at all, really. Um, I mean, we put it as a guide so people know where it is and it's always from. But it, it, it's, we've made it very clear to any lenders that we're sort of, uh, you know, leaning towards a certain product on our marketing. The fact that the rate's not going to win the deal. It's going to be a uh, a criteria um, or, or specific product that suits the client. So we're sort of following on from what Nick was saying earlier sort of links in with this is in how does a lender secure new business and where does the broker place it for me if a lender has a range of products and different areas of uh, uh of sort of sectors um within bridging uh, that they can cover then they've got more chance of that um advice building a relationship with an advisor who's going to be able to place that deal. They won't just think, I'll oh, go to this lender for refurb, I'll choose that one lender for a pre-planning deal, I'll choose that one lender for a commercial lender. Now, everyone does have specialties and everyone has their niche and what they're good at, but to really stand out and to really um, increase the amount of business that you're achieving, I think you've got to have some level of product range. Um, otherwise you are limiting uh, you know, you, the, the, the chances to get the money out the door and also the opportunities to work with those brokers and build those relationships. And it's only by doing multiple deals that they can prove the service levels. And then, you know, it will come down to pricing because, you know, if you've got people competing in the same space that you know will deliver on service, who will deliver on the, on the, on, on the, uh, on the loan and get the deal across the line, then it does come down to pricing. But you, you've got to tick all those things and you've got to have made that impact on the broker in the first place. So um, percentage of people that target interest rate, I'd say limited. It's more, you know, this is where this is why I need the loan. What can I get rather than I've seen this uh, specific interest rate advertised? Can you beat it? Which, you know, I don't imagine gets very far with anyone these days. I, I think it comes oh, under, oh, that, I think it comes under two categories. I think in respect of new clients to the business then then naturally you have to understand that the brokerage on a purely default level people are coming to you to obtain the cheapest cost of funds they can you know that that's ultimately why they're coming to brokerage as kim quite rightly said it's very much from that beginning of the relationship and educational piece especially in terms of short-term finance um where on a very very basic level speed is more often than not a contributory factor getting the deal done is a contributory factor so we have to educate them fortunately we deal with our de our general demographic of client very entrepreneurial professional landlords um and ultimately those type of people when you run a business any type of business and property portfolios and multi-million pound businesses um eventually you will see that in all aspects of the business you'll start looking for value not price and once they're clients of yours once and they've seen the value in your recommendations and why you recommend certain ways and there's been that educational piece from the brokers, the next time they come back, it's not just about rate. But I think with new clients through the door, it's generally about rate first and then you've got to educate as to why rate isn't the most important thing necessarily. Um, so yeah, I think I think new clients, definitely rate is, is at the forefront of their mind, at least initially. 
existing clients hopefully begin to understand the the the, the value of of other aspects and, uh, and other facets of, of of lending i guess yeah yeah i think just on I've just got a quick one because it is relatable to this. I think something we haven't talked about here as well, which I think is really important, is lenders have changed the goalposts. So it's all very well offering your headline rate and offering your max LTV. Um, but when you get to legals and suddenly we're not lending off open market value anymore, we're going to lend off 180 day, we're going to lend off 90 day. Or yes, the pricing was 0.75 a month, but you know what? We've reviewed it now. And we're probably going to shift that up to 0.8. Let's let's also bear in mind the clients already committed funds for the valuation. The clients probably put monies on account for the lawyers as well. So I think something that we've always tried to do is if I make a mistake up front in my assessment of the deal commercially, I still stick to what I what I gave them up front, even if it's not as favourable to us. Because I think from a broker point of view, imagine getting halfway down the, the road and then having to go back to your client and say, oh, by the way, these guys have have changed their mind and I think that's something that I see all the time the amount of times we have deals where I'll say this is what it is no we're going elsewhere they've got a better pricing they've got a better LTV and I say to the broker okay well look, we're here if you want to use us as a fallback two weeks later they'll come back Nick got let down by the lender they changed the goalpost can you carry on with the terms at the start I said listen if we've issued an AIP then we stand by that AIP you know if there's a material change to the loan then of course you have to reassess, and and, and we we did also have to reassess uh, on occasion throughout COVID, uh, purely because everyone was in that panic of are we going to continue to lend or not. But actually, the rule of thumb from Guy and my perspective is, if you say from the outset this is what you're going to do, then you need to stand by it. It's really important. To, to yeah. be fair, and, and just on that point, sorry, Matt, on, on, just on that point, on Nick, on, on standing by things. I mean, not using this as an advertorial for Glendork at all. I mean, it's hopefully it sells itself, but it's so important to look at what happens for borrowers when times go bad as well we're all very happy when times are swimmingly the the loans going well the exits looking good but you need that flexibility on the back end and what i'm seeing is funders coming into the marketplace that approach us and say would you like funding and we politely reject but their active goal is loan to own and that's an awful term that's been in the market for a long time and it's slowly going but all they want to do is load on huge fees on the back end high to three percent a month default rate and there's a lender out there, which is obviously quite well known, that charges 5% if you go a day over to extend your loan. Whereas Nick and I and the whole team's view is you have to be fair. You really have to treat the clients with respect. And, and ultimately, if the loan slips, if there's a problem, you've got to work for them. You don't slam on a fee right at the last second. And I think all of this, what we're talking about, just boils back to having relationships, whether it's with the intermediaries, the brokers, the borrowers, the funders. It really is just about everybody coming together and going, how can we help the client? Like nobody wants to get screwed out of this situation. Everybody has their own bit of the pie they want to run and take from, and and that's how it should be. But for me, it's always about when times go wrong, how good is that lender? And recently I took a bridge loan because obviously can't borrow off myself. And um, we went to a couple of the good guys in the market, um, went round. Some of them were relatively cheap, but they said, oh, it'll take too long. And ended up going with a funder who I knew reputationally would turn this round very quickly. And it was more expensive than the others. But for me personally, I was like, okay, great. This is going to get done in, I think it was done in two weeks, this bridge in, in London. It's fantastic. And for me, it's about the reputation they had versus the reputation of the other one and the relationship as well. So there's multiple factors, as we say. Um, to be fair not, on that. Uh, pricing. To be fair on that, and I think Kim, Rob, and Chris will back me up on this. I hope they will. I, I think that brokers have a key role to play in that as well. I, as much as there are traditional bridging lenders that have moved the goalposts and there was a, 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 a stigma attached to bridging lend because of that for a long time. Um, certain bridging brokerages will also try and, and hide information, and not be transparent, not be comprehensive in the packaging. And that often leads to those material changes and it's easy for the broker to blame the lender for changing terms or changing yeah. um, criteria. And I think the, the role to play, and this is one of the reasons why the race to the bottom, if you like, the, the decrease in margins, when I said it drives innovation, it drives change. You know, lenders, more and more bridging lenders are trying to work with brokerages who will comprehensively package, who will give warts and all at the beginning, will give the fly in the ointment for the merits of the case that back that up. Um, with certain bridging lenders getting dedicated lines into risks, getting dedicated underwriters. You know, so we can cover as many facets of the loan as possible up front. 
and I, I, I think by by doing that, that allows lenders to sort of um, not have to move the goalposts. They can work with these lower margins. Consumers definitely benefit from that. But there's definitely a two way street in respect of that. And yes, there's definitely, a, as, as Guy said, the back end where certain lenders were sort of taking loans on to, to load fees at the back end. But I think also the, 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 a, a huge part that brokers need to pay alongside lenders in, in, in sort of making sure one of the things that really attracted me to Glenhawk when we first started working together, I had very long conversations with Nick, which he alluded to, and it was pretty obvious that, that there was a, an ethical approach to bridging going on there, which isn't necessarily there throughout the industry. Um, and, and I think we're moving towards that, and I think rightfully so. And I think, as I say, this, 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 uh, that ethical approach to lending um, can only work, or, or the margins that are there currently can only work where, where, where brokers are, are being ethical as well. And I think it's a two-way street. Uh, and I think, I think the standards of bridge lending from both lenders and brokers has improved hugely over the last five years. I really do. I really do. And it's also the lender's responsibility to vet brokers that introduce business to them. So actually, you know, that's not something we touched on. And absolutely, I think the brokers have a huge amount of involvement. I think it's very difficult when you first launch a bridging company because the onboarding, for example, is not something you're considering right at the start. It's something that we're starting to implement as we go along and actually creating quality business with quality relationships, people we trust, people we know, uh, position things correctly to their clients. Um, and that's a transitional piece. And I think before you become a corporate lender, you, you need to make that transition. It's something we're pretty much in the middle of it at the moment, you know, because you do get some independent brokers, in line with what Matthew said, where the delivery is pretty poor. And even if you do the, do the deal, they disappear as soon as the, the, the fee's been paid kind of thing. And, and that's something that you need to avoid as you as you become bigger. Um, I'd just like to go on to a slightly different section of our agenda, please. Rob, starting with you, there there must be circumstances in which rates is the defining factor. And does regulated bridging fall into this category? Because presumably this conversation would have a slightly different slant when talking about the regulated side. Um, obviously, this is a, a part of the sector that Glenn Hawke have recently entered. Um, but Rob, if I can get your sort of take on, on that, please. Yeah, um, it's a good question, Karen. So um, yes, it is um, a bigger issue for regulated uh, loans because the consumer has far more protection. And, and obviously um, there is a question of, of perhaps uh, whether the, um, the, the deed and the debt is enforceable if the customer hasn't been treated correctly. So I think for a regulated loan, uh, you know, cost of, cost of credit, I would say rate cost of credit is your number one priority always. Um, and then very quickly after that, because that's a sort of a nanosecond decision, um, it's you know, deliverability of that lender. Um, I think um, quite, a, quite a number of quite interesting points have been made there um, previously. And I think um, I will, for the record, say something pretty controversial here. A large part of the way the market is today is because of the greed of um, intermediaries that aren't bridging experts. They just get a bridging loan and they think they see the size of the size of the commission, they go, right, I can do this. And they go to the wrong lenders, they get the wrong terms, they ask the wrong questions. And then worst of all, when it completes, they get in their, um, their Nikes and they run as quickly as possible and they don't care. And that's, that's part of the problem of the community as it is at the moment. That um, an interesting, you say, Nick, I mean, I think the onboarding process for every lender should be an absolute priority. And, mm -hmm. you know, Karen, Lots of years ago, when when you were in your teens and I was in my uh, in my fifties, you know, we talked about this um, professional bridging qualification and the need, uh, more importantly than that, to say that you can only trade doing bridging loans if you do a number of transactions every quarter, like you do an equity release. And I don't see that being on the table anymore. So, a bit of a call to arms here: this market will continue to be displaced. If you lenders, sorry, when I say you lenders, I don't mean Glenhawk, I mean the industry in general, do not get your onboarding process correctly and just allow anyone to give you business. Because I'm afraid all that will happen is we will start seeing an increase in the number of transactions that you get sort of 
14 months into a nine month term and you can do nothing for them whatsoever. And you think if I could have had that deal 14 months ago, you would have been, you'd have exited by now, you'd be on your term product and you'd have made your money. Businesses, I just uh, thank you for that, Rob. I actually think it, it pretty makes a lot of sense. I don't think it's actually that controversial, at least for an educated group like us. But I, I, I'm glad you brought it up. You also spoke earlier about margin compression potentially forcing good lenders out of this market. But presumably that would happen to specialist brokers and packages as well. And then we would have an outflow of expertise potentially too. Could this also be a consequence of the rates going down, margins being compressed beyond beyond reason and losing what because you've got to buy expertise into your businesses, surely, and you won't be able to do that. Um, well, Karen, that's is that question directed at me there? You want me to answer that? Yeah. OK, cool. Um, yeah, I, I guess possibly. I mean, what, what, I, what I would say is that um, good intermediaries get bridging like it's um you know like it's fresh air they get it they instinctively they instinctively know whether a lender is trying to shark their client by giving a rate that's too high they instinctively know whether the penalty interest is excessive and they would only ever allow a lender to move the goalpost once Right, and they'd never do that again because they would be kicked off their panel. And I have to say, not like not like the um, the playground bully, but we don't have that. We don't have those challenges with our business now. We haven't had it for years. And that's not because we're better than anybody else. It's because simply they won't get away with it because the teams that do bridging get it. That's all they do. They do nothing else. And if you know that, they'll know. They'll know really, really quickly what rate, what fees, what term, and what lender is best for that customer. Because that's all they're doing all day long. They're doing nothing else other than that. I think also on top of that, Karen, um, there's a slight difference, I think, just to be clear to anyone listening in, in terms of lenders are generally driven by the margin of the interest rate, whereas brokers, it's more of a fee, uh, a fee split. So it's a slightly different situation, but I totally agree with Rob. You know, at the end of the day, we've, we've all got to try and improve all the time to make sure that the, 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 mate, the best brokers and the best intermediaries in the market remain in the market. And um, we filter out people that don't represent their clients correctly. Yeah. And ultimately, on your point then, Karen, on could it lead to the, the, like the talent drain as such? Um, that's a really important point because I'm a big believer, and I think Rob and the other guys share this as well, that it's the the people make a business, it's the, the culture, it's what you build out internally. And I see it as like Russian dolls, like every time we bring someone on board, it needs to be a copy of the next person in terms of how they would treat the client, how they would treat uh, the intermediaries, the brokers and so on. Um, and, it, and it really should become infectious, probably not the right word, use, word to use during COVID, but it should become infectious across the whole business. And by having that, you can treat people correctly and with the fairness that they deserve. Um, and in terms of the talent, I think, it's, I get people approach me probably three, four times a year going, I'm looking to start a bridge lender, can you help me? Me being me, I sit down with them and have a chat. I don't mind at all. And I'll give them the time of day. And they'll say, oh, who do we need in the business? And I'll say, well, I had a compliance here. Oh, you need to invest heavily in your team. And ultimately, that's what benefits you. And I think a lot of these new guys coming in aren't willing to invest in the talent and the best in the market uh, to achieve what they want to do. There's some wonderful people out there and we're far finding hiring hard at the moment because there's a lot of people not willing to to move around and switch. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately it comes down to the talent will stay where they feel the right culture and they share the right values with the lender or the, or the intermediary and so on. Thank you, Guy. Um, I wanted to cut, sort of come back to the idea, uh, which I just want to cover off the idea of pricing for risk and how important that is in bridging. And then Rob alluded to it earlier, all the factors that need to be worked into the cost, um, be that expertise, complexity, the time it takes to, to work through one of these transactions, especially on, on the, the more complex side. How it, does the panel have any thoughts on how this pricing should be structured? And is there ever a future where we can have a sustainable 
rates across the market is that something that we could look forward to at all <laughs> well i think straight away you've got you've got different ways of pricing anyway so at glenhawk we still individually price i still individually price based on what i perceive the risk to be of the deal um however there's a lot of lenders out there as you become bigger you can't have someone sitting there pricing every deal because it's just it's just not time efficient so then they use pricing indexes, which most of the, I mean, certainly Matthew, Chris, Rob and Kim will be used to that. They can look it up and sort of say, well, it sits within this bracket. So this is what the, the pricing is. But I think it would be very difficult for everyone. Again, if I allude back to the point that you've got three different types of lenders here, Challenger, sort of your standard middle tier and your boutique, I think it would be very difficult to have one level of pricing. But in terms of risk return, you know, you just have to look at the core fundamentals, you know, who is the client? Who is the intermediary? What is the asset? Where is the asset? You know, is there a refurb element to the deal? How strong is the exit? You know, and they're the sort of five or six commercial points that I assess on every deal pre-pricing. But at the same time, I try to keep it consistent. So I won't price at 0.85 a month and 0.65 a month. You know, at the moment, we're very much between 0.75 and sort of 0.78, 0.79. Um, but again, it's about the quality of the business you bring in. You know, for example, one of my BDs, all of my BDs are great. One of my BDs specifically brings in the same kind of deal over and over and over and over. So I am comforted straight away that I can be fair and price at a, at, a, at a margin where it makes us money, but also being fair to the wider market, whether that's for the client's benefit, but also for the broker's benefit. So the likes of Matthew, Chris, Kim and Rob know where I am positioned in the market. Um, Chris, just coming to you with a, a little bit of a um, wild card suggestion here. You mentioned some the possibility of a low rate could indicate that there are other charges and fees that perhaps aren't being presented up front. Could we revisit the idea of doing standardised um, pricing metrics and uh, APRs in bridging? Well, oh, they, they they do on regulated loans with uh, illustrations, don't they? So it, it, it could be replicated very quickly um, and probably be supported by many people in the industry. So can it be done? Well, we know we know it can because it's it, it's already been done. Um, will the lenders want to do it? Well, I think that if they want to secure the business, they're going to need to. And it's not going to become a choice at some stage. But. Yeah, I can't see people wanting to do the additional work and disclosing uh, everything about their position, making it incredibly clear, because you can certainly imagine where the default interest will have to be on that on that sheet. And that will have to be in bold letters stating if it's not paid back in time, this is going to be your, uh, your, your, your charges and your fees. So, I mean, that could be one thing. Also, it, it's also front end fees as well. You know, some lenders charge arrangement fees, but have additional administration fees and other little fees that they sort of pick up along the way. So it, it, it's it's a, a document that would be shared or that, that all lenders would be on board and agree to do would have to be forced upon them. Um, I've, I'd, I'd love to see that happen. I, I can't see it happening. I think, Certainly not. I in think the also you'd, you'd need regulation until unregulated business becomes regulated, then actually you haven't got any reason, actually, uh, there's no reason for a lender to go down that route at the moment, I think. Uh, Except for best, have, best practice, best practice do, purposes. Do, I mean, I can think of a couple of organisations that could probably lead something like this, but I mean, Rob and I have also ta kind of looked at this before in a previous life in connection with the trade body, and it is very difficult to get people to, to get on board with it. I just thought I'd floated again for the, once a year i should talk about this and see if, if people will take it up <laughs> in some ways though it's not quite as binary as as should there be that level of regulation or or, or not one of the you know part of best practice is, is what's best for the consumer and ultimately there's a lot of ethical lenders like glenn Hall, um who may have default rates that kick in depending on the circumstance so if the client is communicating throughout expresses the reasons and the problems of why they may go over term brokers communicate and everyone's managing everyone's expectation then they'll quite rightly extend that bridge and work with the client work with the brokerage if there's no communication there's clearly problems in the background um, they're not sticking to their side of the bargain for one of a quite simple phrase those default rates come in you know putting those kind of things in a black and white illustration um, 
and, and that, or having binary rules in some ways um, no longer differentiates between a good broker and a bad broker, a good client and a bad client. And I, th I think there's all sorts of different uh, areas to that. And I don't think it's, it's, I don't think there's an easy solution to that. I really don't. Mm. Um, we've got just a few minutes left. I just wanted to do a quick trip around the panel and get your final thoughts on this topic, anything that we possibly haven't covered. And um, I'll start with um, Matthew because we have a question from the audience here, which I, I wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, it says here, we often hear that brokers are trying to present the deal in the best way, but where is the line when it comes to packaging a case well? and hiding detrimental information from the lender. Uh, surely this just negatively impacts the borrower in the long term as the lender will eventually uncover these, this detail. Um, what do you think? It's a, it's a really good question. I, I think, um, you know, what is presenting the deal in, in the best way to the lender would probably, without being judgmental, differ from brokerage to brokerage. I think the reality is, and, and, and where the market should be, um, you know, and not just myself. I know. I know Kim and Rob personally, and I'm sure Chris as well. You know, to be in, to be here. You know, we're, we're we're very passionate about the industry and doing things ethically. And ultimately, presenting the case in the best way to the lender isn't hiding information because, as as the the the, the person who's raised the question quite rightly alludes to, there's a huge chance that will come out at some point down the line, whether that's within underwriting, pre-offer checks within legals, when, when the client's undergone significant cost and lost significant time. What makes a huge difference is a, a broker that, that is experienced and knows exactly what they're doing and understands lenders' different subtleties towards and attitudes towards risk and attitudes towards security and will actually present upfront the, the, the areas of the case and the areas of the lending that, that if you like would raise questions will paint the full picture and the full merits of the client which will incorporate their, their financials the LTV their experience the, maybe the reasons why there is that fly in the ointment the advantages to it and present it in a way where the, 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 the lender has um, if you like all facets of that loan up front deemed at a senior enough level where people have got the mandate to make those decisions and getting that agreement up front rather than just sticking a case in and seeing what happens and then maybe going to the next lender which which has been unfortunately a traditional way you know with 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 a lot of people out there and I, and, I, and i think that way uh lenders have confidence with brokerages clients have confidence with brokerages and it creates those long-term relationships and i think as soon as lenders feel you have the potential to hide information i think the trust has gone and i think quite rightly they have to dig even deeper when underwriting your cases. You know, a number of our case managers are ex-underwriters. They would underwrite different brokerages' cases differently, not through favoritism, not through, oh, well, they've got one over me before, I'll try to get one over me, I'm gonna dig a bit deeper. But because if they knew certain brokerages would cover all points and be completely transparent, they didn't know, need to go through the same level of digging and would bring those cases to the top to get them off their desk quicker. And I think, and this is one of the reasons why ourselves and, and obviously other people on the panel have dedicated underwriters, have dedicated lines to risk, have relationships at a senior level because of the quality of the business that we will introduce. And I think there's another advantage to bridge and lenders, which we haven't talked about here, of working with brokerages like Kim, Rob and Chris that deal with all facets of lending. You know, if you're just a bridging broker and there's nothing wrong, there's good bridging brokers out there. But if you're just a bridging broker, in many respects, when you introduce that deal, you know, Rob said people then grab their Nikes and go running. When you introduce that deal, effectively, as long as you think that feasible out, often that's enough for a lot of these guys to put the deal in. It's very much our problem in three months' time, six months' time, nine months' time, when the person wants to get out of the bridge, because they'll be coming to us for the refinance, assuming the out is through refinance. So we have to make sure we've done all of our due diligence, which is how it should be. So no, presenting the case the right way, there is no line, in essence, but what it is about is understanding a lender, understanding their attitude to risk and, and, and what aspects, um, even if it's not part of the lending criteria, is going to give the lender the comfort to say, yeah, I'll sign that out off outside of policy. I'll, I'll lend on that at this rate, even though normally for this category, we want this rate. 
and, and the, the cost saving to the consumer and the cost saving in underwriting to the lender can be huge when, when everything when teams work together and when things are done properly. Thank you very much, Matthew. It's a great answer. And Kim, can I just come to you for your final thoughts on this topic? And thank you very much for, for your uh, role in today's conversation as well. Thanks, Karen. Um, I've absolutely loved it today. And I think there's been a couple of points that's been mentioned, and that is predominantly the area that we all work in is the unregulated space. Um, with it being unregulated, no one is forcing anyone to be ethical, best practice, However, we choose to run our businesses that way. Um, I think that we all know those lenders and those brokers that are out there that don't run their businesses that way. And I think when it comes to, I loved your idea about, you know, as with regulated, showing the true costs, showing the true um, charges that are on a case. But there is no one that I know that would go down that route. Um, because also what we've spoken about, bridging is so unique um, in the fact that it's not just about that cost and pricing everyone's situation is just so different so whilst I love that idea it could also be detrimental to a client that just kind of clings to that one point point. and um, one thing that we haven't mentioned that is and I'll try to wrap this up quite quickly is that we're finding that a lot of clients are actually shopping around at the moment um, and they are coming to you and they are saying well I've got this broker that can give me this rate and they've sold them the dream um, however you know we do these bridging cases day in and day out like we've all said um, we know who we're recommending and that can be quite difficult conversations to place and to have with clients. So we are seeing that a little bit more. Um, but like I said, being ethical and best practice is what sets us apart from those those other brokers that, you know, just want the money um, and they're recommending the wrong the wrong lenders for clients. So, yeah, that's how we are completely training our team um, going forwards. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'll be coming back to you under a separate cover about the shopping around thing, because there's definitely a conversation to be had there. Um, Rob, over to you for your what you'd like to leave our viewers with, any pearls of wisdom from your side. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I do have any pearls of wisdom at all, even, even in, in a necklace format. So, um, look, I, I, I think it's been a, a really good hour. Thank you, Bridging Commercial and Glen Hawk for um, arranging this um i think it's um the, the headline is a headline i don't think the direction of flight is anything to worry about um i think this continues to be a fully functioning very positive very compliant very ethical um sector i think we talk uh, naturally um often about those in our community that aren't doing uh it the right way and unfortunately do exist on both lending and intermediary side of uh, of, of the vets um, but let's not lose um, any sense of uh, face on this this sector has moved a quantum leap um, in the last decade in the last five years um, it's it's gone turbocharged in terms of what it does it's uh, very compliant it's very functioning it's very settled uh, very trusting and it's a great place to do business Thank you, Rob. Uh, final thoughts from you, Chris? Sure. Um, I mean, all of us have been talking about, you know, rate being one of the last things that everyone looks at, but I really think let's not underestimate how important the rate is, because without having a rate that is relatively market leading, it, it's going to be very tough to win business unless there is some reason out, uh, outside it, the criteria that it fits with no one else, because there's because there are so many lenders out there, the deals often work with more than just the one lender therefore rate is very important and um so <laughs> i i can't see that changing but i just don't, i don't think it's going to go down too much further i don't think it can i think where their price at the moment seems fair like rob says the industry's moved forward so much and i think it's a great place to be right now lending uh, and advising and for all those clients with such a wide a wide range of options available to them Karen, so I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Sorry, guys. Can hear you. Sorry. Um, Guy, what would you like to leave us with? Uh, don't start a lender. <laughs> would, be, <laughs> would, be, would be my advice if you want to sleep well at night. Um, clearly, the rate chasing that's going on is, uh, is interesting, but I, I agree with Chris and probably the broad consensus is that 
and Rob as well in terms of the long-term nature of this business uh, and the beast that is bridging. It's it, it, it's gonna it'll, it'll ease off at some point, I think. Um, but as I said at the start, in my opening comments, it's just the phenomenal amount of liquidity in this space at the moment, and people thinking it's easy to get into bridging, it's easy to win the deals, it's easy to set the clients up, but Really, I think the underlying core to this for me is all just all about like the relationships with uh, your intermediaries, your your clients, the borrowers, and so on. Because there are so many, there's, there are certain people out there that ruin the sector for everybody, whether they're in the middle or whether they're the lender. It's just whether they come to us going, oh, I want to put a 5% fee on for this client on the front end. And no matter how good the deal is, we'll never even touch anything like that. It's just not fair and it's not the way we operate. Um, but I think ultimately it comes down to people. I'd like the idea of, uh, the, some sort of standard within the industry. It's just how we would do that and how we would police that. Um, I definitely think that would clean it up. Um, but there are some great operators out there. I mean, many of our rivals are great businesses. They operate well. Um, and um, uh, they've, they've been role models for me as, as we've been building the business out. So in terms of the rate, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it will ease off as the liquidity eases off into other assets. You're always going to get a bank that will pop up and say, Oh, we've got 200 million of savings here because we've got an ad in the Daily Mail and we've been flooded with cash. We're going to do bridging at 0.4. Um, or you're going to get a pension fund and go, oh, we're going to flood that. So it'll go up and down. Lenders have their allocations, their buckets, their covenants. Uh, and it's ultimately about the relationships, I think. Um, but yeah, that's that's it from me. Thanks, guys, for, for coming on the panel today as well and joining us. It's been really interesting hearing all your thoughts. Thank you, Guy. And finally, Nick. Um, well, yeah, leave me last. Everyone said everything. Um, so yeah, obviously, uh, echoing what everyone said, really, you know, such an exciting market to work in. You know, we, I'm sure, if, you know, off camera we were to discuss the market. You, you love going to work every day, and that's got the core of that has to come from doing things the right way, being ethical, having the right approach. Because, you know, ultimately, it's life doesn't need to be full of greed. It's about winning you know and if the client wins the broker wins the lender wins then that's that's what you want the reputation to be i mean obviously going back 15 years when i first started in this it was you i mean it's completely different i mean it's the opposite end of the scale you know there was three or four lenders back then like we said earlier 20 25 percent per year it was all uh loan to own whereas now it's a re retail market it's a needed market it's a growing market i don't know exactly what the figures are but i think it's predicted at between seven and eight billion pound market now i might be wrong there but that's loosely where we've had the figures so you know for me it's just about working with the right partners um i want all my developers and all my clients to to do well i want to help them achieve the result they want to achieve and on the back of that you know as as the intermediary or the lender we also benefit and thanks to everyone for coming on Thanks a lot. Um, so thank you very much to, to Glenn Hawke, to Guy and Nick for, su for supporting this roundtable today. And a uh, huge thanks to Rob, Kim, Matthew and Chris too. This was one of those conversations I knew we'd go over time on because it's, it's, it's very involved. But just to close off and echo what Rob was saying about how well the sector is doing. For me, the fact that we could have this conversation, this topic, live relatively unscripted is a mark of the maturity of the sector and that we can dig deep into some of the areas which i mean quite frankly 10 years ago would have been a no-go sort of conversation yeah. um so thank you very much thank you to our viewers that tune in uh, we will be publishing this video in full next week along with a short highlights article to kind of pull out some of the salient facts that we've, that we've discussed today. Uh, so thank you very much and um, just leaves me to wish everyone a wonderful rest of their day and week. Mm -hmm.